This is Epicenter Bitcoin, episode 105, with guest Vlad Zamfir. This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Bitcoin, the show which talks about technology, startups, and projects driving decentralization and the global technology cryptocurrency revolution. Uh, I'm here today with... Uh, Vlad Zamfir. Vlad is probably known to some of you because he's the researcher at Ethereum who's been behind the sort of next level protocol uh, of bringing proof of stake to Ethereum because that's been a project for a while for them to switch away from proof of work to proof of stake. And, and that's exactly the thing Vlad is working on. He's just got back also from London where DEF CON was taking place. I'm sure many of you have heard about it as well. It was the very first sort of pure Ethereum conference, a full week. And so, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, Vlad. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so how was, how was DEF CON? DEF CON was awesome. I was actually kind of shocked at how much, like, more sophisticated, larger uh, this was than DEF CON Zero, which was, like, just over a year ago. We've come a long way in one long year. Yeah, I mean, I was at DEF CON Zero, at least for parts of it, and that, that wasn't exactly a huge thing. And now it's, how many people were there? Um, I think 300 around. Yeah, that's, that's definitely impressive. And it's, it's great how, how far the project has gone uh, since then. Yeah, it's kind of shocking to look back. So when did you get originally involved in Ethereum? So I got involved at the Toronto Bitcoin Expo. Uh, back in April of 2014. That's when I really, I had learned about Ethereum a couple of months prior to that, but that's when I really got involved. That's when I met most of the Ethereum team and um, sort of started volunteering for them on like a full-time basis or basically as like an obsessive hobby. Yeah. And, and so was, was from the very start your interest, especially in consensus and how the Ethereum network reaches agreement? No, no, actually at first I started working on kind of higher levels of the stack. I was working on like distributed applications and infrastructure that distributed applications would need. For example, uh, like file sharing and reputation systems. Um, and then only after I started kind of learning a lot more was I even able to get involved with the consensus protocol discussions. And then I started going down that rabbit hole. And then around September last year, I realized that like proof of stake is like possible, like that we could actually secure a blockchain with digital signatures. Um, and then I started, you know, learning a lot more and going down that rabbit hole, which turns out to be kind of much more complex than and involved than I ever would have realized. So what was it about? consensus and, and the possibility of switching to proof of stake that fascinated you so much? Well, so, I mean, consensus protocols are like key to this kind of like decentralized, decentralized technology, right? Um, and proof of stake specifically is interesting because it is much more economically efficient. It can be, uh, you can have the same level of security at a much lower cost, which is appealing to me. Uh, and also, there are some aspects of blockchain scaling that are much easier with proof of stake. And blockchain scaling is like, you know, it has been important to me, you know, before proof of stake became important to me. Right. So did you study before, did you study computer science before or? No, my background's in mathematical statistics. Okay. So I guess that's actually quite related, you know, and especially the way Casper works. And, and we'll, we'll get to that, but, you know, with the probabilistic models you're using and the sort of economic approach to it. Sure, yeah, it's somehow a little bit tangentially related. <laughs> okay, so, so starting about Casper, I mean, we've had some people on the show, for example, we've had like Adam Back and Greg Maxwell on the show once, and I asked them about proof of stake, and they were like, oh, this is impossible, it doesn't work, like it's been proven, it doesn't work. And then there are some problems, right, that people have talked about uh, with proof of stake for a long time, and, and the two best known about of those are 
what's called the long range attack and what's called the nothing at stake problem. And so obviously with Casper, right, you, you have to solve those in some way. But maybe we can, we can start by talking about these problems briefly and, and just sort of how you address that. Sure. So actually, we kind of solve both problems with the same the same mechanism, uh, which is uh, to use security deposits to to secure the consensus. So just for for the people that know, can you also run us through what those problems are and and what those attacks actually look like? Yeah, sure. So um, the the nothing at stake problem is basically the problem that you have no disincentive from being Byzantine in a traditional proof of stake protocol. Uh, because signatures are easy to produce and because you aren't punished for signing multiple blocks on multiple chains, your incentive is to sign off forks when they, when they come up. Uh, so the nothing at stake problem is the problem that you don't really lose anything from behaving badly. Right. So, so, so with Bitcoin, right, if you compare with Bitcoin, if there's a fork in Bitcoin, well, you can't mine on both chains because, well, I mean, you, ha you can, but you have to split your hashing power. But if it's just a signature, then well, what stops you from signing on two chains at the same time? And when you have a fork, then I, the problem, I guess, would be how do you know they're going to come together again if you know you can have them run at the same time? Yeah, that's right. And so to be a little bit more explicit, if you split your mining power due to like uncertainty about which fork will win in Bitcoin, you'll surely lose you know one of those portions of mining power. And so you have a really incent strong incentive to mine mostly, if not all, on the chain that you believe will be the one that's successful. Um, whereas in proof of stake, in traditional proof of stake, you know, your incentive is to sign everywhere because it doesn't cost you anything and you're going to get returns on either if there are returns on any. Okay, great. And what about, um, oh, so how, how is this problem solved? So you mentioned security deposit. How exactly does that work? Yeah, so the idea is that to produce blocks, you have to place a security deposit. And if you behave in a demonstrably Byzantine manner, uh, then some or all of your security deposit will be removed from you. And so there like will be something at stake. I mean, the most kind of naive basic thing to say is if you sign blocks on both chains, then someone will observe that, produce a little thing we call an evidence transaction, which includes, includes like proof that you did this, and then that would lead to the forfeiture of your security deposit. So then, there, so the idea is that you know there is something at stake, and it's this large security deposit. And how does that translate into the the long range attack problem, or, or what exactly is the long range attack problem? So the long range attack problem is a problem that if an adversary somehow gets control of, say, a, a key that held most of the coins at some day, time in the past, they could use that to create blocks from the past, creating like basically a big a big chain that ends up having. A higher score than the chain that um, is currently the consensus chain. So the long-range attack problem has to do with the fact that uh, digital signatures are only secure, economically secure, so long as they have coins behind them. Uh, and then over time, keys that used to have coins on them no longer have coins on them, and so they're not really economically secure anymore. There's no cost you really need to pay to compensate someone for having that. Uh, and so their long-range attack problem is that people will use old keys to produce chains with higher fork, higher scores in order to kind of revert history and affect the consensus. So, so basically it could be like at, at the beginning of the chain, right, there's some keys that hold the deposits of the validators and, and the bonds, and then, you know, people move away from that. And, and, you know, I go to you and say, hey, you had these keys in the beginning. Why don't you give them to me? They're worthless to you anyway. I'll, I'll pay you something, and I'll, I'll do that with a lot of people. And all of a sudden, I have uh, a majority at that stage, and then I can start creating a chain from there um, and sort of overtake the real chain. And, and all of a sudden, I have a parallel chain that's actually uh, fake, but it looks as if it's real. Yeah, and I mean, it's not fake. It's like, it is real, and it's just better than the one that exists that everyone is on. It's just, it wasn't the consensus until you just showed it to everyone, and then everyone would, like, switch over to that because it's a better, it's a better history. How would it be a better history? Uh, in the sense that the fork choice rule uh, gives it a higher score. So, you know, in Bitcoin, we have this fork choice rule that says, like, the heavier chain, i.e. the one with the most proof of work, is the one that is 
that you should choose if you're like a client trying to figure out what the consensus is. Um, and then similarly in proof of stake, traditional proof of stake protocols, uh, you would have like a longest fork rule. Can you explain that? What would that look like, the longest fork rule? Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, you everyone would adopt the fork that is just like longer, like has more blocks in it. Uh, and you'd be able to make a longer fork with these keys from the past because um, you kind of, you have most of the keys, right? And you can make your fork have more participation than people actually participate in like the traditional, in the like main fork. Okay, so because if you have all the keys, let's say uh, maybe otherwise the problem is like latency because the keys are across the globe or maybe sometimes uh, people don't... It's the participation rate really. Participation. Because people don't really always stake, right? And then that slows it down. Yeah. Okay, okay. Interesting. And so how does the security deposit, I mean, it makes sense how it addresses the, um, the nothing at stake problem, right? By, by punishing people who abuse that and sign on several chains, but how does it solve the long range attack problem? Sure. So basically what happens is that um, you will only trust a signature from someone who you know currently has a security deposit. And so actually uh, the authentication model is somewhat different because instead of kind of authenticating the current state of history based on the Genesis block, uh, we, we're going to use the people who currently have security deposits in order to uh, authenticate the consensus and download whatever changes are required or whatever state is required uh, in order to synchronize with the consensus. So instead of authentication ending in the Genesis block, it ends in a kind of much more timely piece of information, which is um, the people who have security deposits now. So you have like a list of currently bonded validators, and those are who can sign to uh, help you synchronize with the consensus. So um, that's kind of important because um, it prevents long-range attack problems because we don't use that kind of... We, don't, we never use keys that no longer have deposits on them um, for anything, ever. Um, and then the way you kind of stay synced up is that uh, the next set of validators is signed in by the current set of validators. And so you can kind of stay synchronized once you've synchronized once. Now, before you have the list of modern validators, you're going to need to get that information out of band uh, before you can synchronize with the consensus. It kind of serves as like one public key for the entire consensus. And so everyone in the world who wants to synchronize will need to have this list. Or really, more, more realistically, it'll be a hash, which you can you know, provide Merkle proofs to. Um, if you have this like hash or this list, then you can synchronize. And then e if everyone, uh, and everyone needs to make sure that they have like the canonical consensus hash or list. Uh, and so basically, and I, I don't think that this is actually a too terrible uh, because, you know, public key cryptography is hard and people don't like authenticating public keys, but it's going to be a lot easier when there's only one that everyone needs to authenticate because then we can use publishing. Um, and we, are, we have lots of reliable means of publishing. Uh, and then, and there are like kind of other things like you could, just, for example, if you want, if someone wants to take a payment from you, they don't have an incentive to give you a false hash because um, they want to accept payment on the on the authentic chain. Right. So, because because I mean, let, let's say someone did make a long range attack here, and and now I have a list, uh, and and uh, I have a chain too, and on that chain I have all the validators. I mean. And then I could go to you and say, hey, you know, here's the chain, I have the validator. So, so presumably the security you would have is by if you beforehand, if you know who is the true list of validators, then when I come to you with my long range chain, you'd say, no, these are the wrong validators. You know, I don't trust this chain. Uh, I only trust the chain that has the same set of validators. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's exactly the idea. And so you, yeah, you just have to stay synced up guys, and, and, and trust some source to get that correct list of validators. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, so, but if you're staying synced up, then there, there is no trust there in the sense that you can authenticate all the changes in the set of validators using kind of this econo economic proofs, right? 
where you basically can rely on it because if it wasn't true, then these people would lose large amounts of security deposits. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, this seems like a very reasonable thing to me, right? Because it's, I, I, the question, I guess, would be how do you technically implement that, right? How, how does a client actually get that list? Because, of course, people presumably won't be doing that manually, but there will be some mechanism in the client that automatically fetches the list from somewhere. And, and that's where a lot of it will depend on. So that's, that's, a, that's a good question, right? Um, and this is something that we kind of talk about. Um, one idea for most users is that like, when you get your client, firstly, it, because you don't, you, you don't actually have any ability to audit the code, it would just kind of come with the most recent list of validators. But for a user who's like a power user, you'd want to authenticate that yourself out of band, and you'd want to go and like look through various places where people are talking about and publishing these things and make sure that you have the same one that everyone else does. Um, and basically, uh, there are, the user experience for that is still to be seen. Part, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are solutions um, that are like super secure where the client kind of just like asks you to find the most recent uh, set of validators. Um, but totally, from a protocol point of view, it's 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 totally necessary because the set of validators changes over time, the set of people with security deposits changes over time, and there's no way for you to kind of authenticate a one at time T, you know, 100 if you're if you only know the set of validators at like T50 because it's an entirely different set and you can't rely on the signatures from the first one to figure out the second one. So can validators change like all the time, or because if you, I guess if you we're at T50 and you say, oh, all validators, you know, they have to bond for at least six months or something, right? And then, well, you could s tell um, to some accuracy uh, if a list is valid at the later stage, you know, to the extent that the same validators, you know, must be included because uh, they just can't withdraw it immediately. Is there a mechanism like that as well? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, that's that's totally right. So if so, it, it's totally cool for new validators to come in because your validators are still in there and like you still have all the security you did before the new validators came in. Um, it's when the validators that you know about unbond that you need to start to worry. And as a, uh, if we have some fixed rule about how long you must be bonded for, then for any period longer than that. Uh, there's no guarantee, there's no like ironclad guarantee that the validators will still be bonded. So they might be, and they, you know, probably in practice likely will be because in practice, uh, you'll, if they're profitable, they'll stick around, and if they're not, they eventually won't. Uh, and so some of the validators will be around from one bonding period to the next. But if, say, like, you know, if, say, 10% of the, of the validators you know about are gone, maybe that's, you know, not the worst thing in the world. Maybe, but if 90% of them are gone, then that's like quite a disaster for your security and authentication. Um, but basically, to keep it simple, uh, we would we should require that like clients know 100% of the validators all the time. There are kind of more complicated protocols that don't have that property, where you know you may know less than 100% of the validators, but there are perks like more people can bond at any time. And that could be used as defensive, used defensively, um, but ba basically, the kind of this this kind of gets you an idea of how like uh, just like this basic design decision has uh, some details that need to be kind of thought carefully through, of exactly like how people are allowed to bond and unbond, and how clients react to that, and how they authenticate based on how many of the validators that they know about are still online, how do they find out about changes to the validator set. You know, these are all questions that uh, we have solutions for, uh, but we have multiple solutions for. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, if, if you just look at it from a sort of a high level, uh, the, the, it seems like a, a reasonable and sound solution. So I'm curious, because a, a lot of people, sort of old school Bitcoiners and, and people who are very, you know, deeply uh, in the space, and, and you're also people who are super smart, I mean, uh, and and I would say sort of from a research perspective and, and aren't so much, you know, invested in Bitcoin or currency, uh, are very skeptical about proof of stake. Why do you think that is? Um, so it's pretty easy to understand why you can have an, a me uh, use 
resources that are external to the consensus protocol as an anti-civil mechanism, right? So if like these the assumption is that civil doesn't have as many resources as the honest network, and so uh, if you kind of size up people's resources outside the network, then and then the majority is probably not civil. That's kind of like the assumption. Um, it's kind of a little bit harder to wrap your mind around how you can use something inside the consensus as an anti-civil mechanism to secure the consensus. Um, but I'm actually quite comfortable with this. And the, I mean, one intuition for why you should be comfortable with this is that actually Bitcoin is only economically secure so long as Bitcoin has a price in the first place because the hash power won't be high unless the people are compensated for their expense with something that they can sell to pay for their costs. And so really, it's you kind of have this phenomenon that if Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a price, then Bitcoin is secure. And if Bitcoin is secure, then it can have a price. So there's like a bootstrapping that's required. And that same mechanism could be used for uh, an asset that's inside the consensus being used to secure the consensus because there's an asset in there, and still we assume that civil won't have a majority of the wealth. I mean, you know, we might assume, we might be just as comfortable assuming that in the protocol than outside of the protocol. Uh, and then because it has a price, they're going to be disincentivized from behaving badly if they place a security deposit, which has a price that could be removed by the protocol. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. That's the first time I heard of that, but actually it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I guess the, the challenge here too is, is if, if you try to explain uh, proof of work to sort of normal people, quote unquote, you know, who try to understand how this Bitcoin work, I think it's, it's actually possible to do that pretty well. Um, you know, you can say it's sort of a lottery and a betting game. And uh, I think it's, it works fairly well. But how do you do that with Casper or with, with proof of stake? Do you try to do that to like explain it to sort of you know people who ask you what are you working on? How is Ethereum going to be secured when it switches to your system? You know who aren't deeply from uh, this industry and this uh, ecosystem. Yeah, so I mean, surely it's a lot more complicated and it is harder to explain. But people usually find it pretty intuitive uh, that the system uses security deposits to punish bad actors. Um, that's actually the main thing that distinguishes proof of stake security to proof of work security, is that um, you can make the consensus expensive for adversaries only when they're attacking, uh, which is very different from the Bitcoin system, which makes it expensive for everyone all the time. And then j just in case at some point an adversary would want to spend some 50% or more of that. Uh, so I think that people on a high level find it easy to understand on a low level, when you start to get into all the details, it becomes much more complicated. And that's when people who uh, have like a, st a strong preference for simplicity um, can get turned away. But um, the, the advantages of this kind of pro protocol, I think, are very promising and very worth kind of going through all that and talking about all of the reasons why we have all these design decisions it or and you know uh, kind of showing the benefit from the complexity. Yeah, I, and and to be quite honest, I think Bitcoin is easy or proof of work is reasonably or somewhat easy to explain from a high level too. But then once you start getting into the really nitty gritty and the game theory and stuff and mining pools and and collusion, it gets extremely complicated as well. So I, I think you, you sort of have the, the same problem there. Maybe it's even more complicated with something like Casper, but uh, that's not something where Bitcoin is sort of like trivially simple either. Yeah, so that, that's actually true. Bitcoin is very easy to specify, very hard to analyze. I'd say that Casper is kind of different. It's, it's easy to specify, but the analysis is, is actually quite a, quite a lot easier when it comes to uh, analysis of like different uh, types of adversarial strategies between validators. And that's something that uh, I'm sure we'll get into through the course of this podcast. Yeah, so, so let's get started with that. First of all, I mean, Casper, the name comes from, from Ghost, right? Uh, what was Ghost and why, how is Casper related to that? So Ghost is an algorithm for proof of work consensus called Greedy Heaviest Observed Subtree that um, kind of stretch the definition of blockchain into this like block tree thing in order to provide much more low latency transaction confirmation, 
with the same eventual consistency guarantees. Um, and basically, kind of intuitively, the way it works is that instead of having orphan blocks be kind of lost and never contribute to the security of the network and never reward the miner who mined them with bitcoins, orphan blocks could be included as like uncles um, and they would contribute to the score of the fork and they would also and, and, and the miners would also be rewarded for that. So that, that allows you to do much lower block times without compromising on security. Uh, which is uh, good, great for user experience. And for Ethereum as an application platform, having low latency is, uh, is especially important. Um, so, Go so Casper is, a, is the friendly ghost. Uh, it's an adaptation of Ghost Proof of Stake. Uh, and so that's, wh that's why it's a ghost. It's basically designed to, to provide low latency, uh, low latency blocks and to kind of um, use orphaned information uh, to as part of like the rewards, the reward like incentive mechanism. Let's take a short break to talk about Hide.me. Look, when you're choosing a VPN provider, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected. You know, if a government agency tries to force the VPN provider to hand over some of your traffic or ban or or browsing information. Will they be able to do that? And is your payment information attached to the account? These are all things that you want to consider when choosing a VPN provider. With Hide.me, all that's taken care of. For starters, they're based in Malaysia, and Malaysian laws don't require them to keep any logs. In fact, Hide.me has no logs of your traffic or browsing uh, history. So even if a government agency was trying to force them to hand over some information, they would be straight out of luck because Hide.me has nothing to give them. In addition to that, they use a third party, party payment provider, uh, which uh, doesn't give them any of your payment information. So they have, they have no way to link an account to like a credit card or a PayPal account. So even if your payment with PayPal or credit card, there's no way for Hide.me to know which account paid for what. And of course, if you're paying with Bitcoin, then you're completely transparent. And uh, so what we suggest is if you're creating an account with Hide.me, if you want that extra level of privacy, just make a fake Gmail address and use that to sign in. So that way you're completely anonymous. You can give Hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hide.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's going to get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices. So your whole household fits on the plan. And you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world. And they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. One of the things that I, I understand least well about Casper is that there's a strange thing going on where validators uh, are betting on different chains and then they lose money or gain money depending on if their bet is correct. And then somehow this is supposed to sort of lead everybody to bet on the same thing and provide that sort of confirmation. You know that with Bitcoin, you know, the majority might not change. Well, uh, I guess it doesn't quite carry over the analogy, but w can you explain how does that betting work and why did you, why did you choose that? Sure. So basically, um, the idea with the betting strategy is that we're, what we're doing is, is, uh, we're incentivizing them to come to consensus. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by having them place some of their security deposit at stake in a process, an iterated process through which they come to agree on which block at a particular height will have its transactions executed. So they bet on blocks uh, and they're betting on which blocks other validators will be betting on. So the way they make the most return is if they bet very quickly with very high probability on the blocks that everyone else eventually bets very with very high probability. Um, so they the incentive is to bet in the way that other people will bet in the future. And if you don't bet correctly, then you're going to make less returns than if you do. Uh, and so everyone's incentive is to quickly, quickly converge on the same block at every height. And then once you have consensus on the same blocks at every height, then we can have consensus on the state of every application. So how does that work? Do you, 
each validator can propose blocks or, or, or they propose it someplace and then validators choose which one to bet on with what amounts or anybody can propose blocks? Yeah, so strictly speaking, anyone can propose blocks at any height. Um, and then the validators will just like bet on the different blocks that are available at heights that haven't that they haven't already like bet and converged on. Um, and basically, uh, but it is worth noting that Casper suggests an order uh, that they should propose their blocks in. And that's the order in which uh, they make the most return if they actually end up producing their blocks. If they deviate from that order, they end up making less returns. And the reason for this is that um, we don't want them to stop certain blocks from winning based on you know, maybe they don't like a transaction that's in that block, right? If uh, they they could they could engage in censorship by not allowing any blocks produced by some coalition who isn't worth who isn't um, censoring uh, ever win. And so, while anyone can produce a block at any height and people can bet um, at any height, their incentive is to do it in an orderly manner in order to increase their profitability. Okay. And then you also have a punishment, right? So if you if you do bad bets, you get punished. Is that correct? Yeah. So I mean, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of things, right? One of them is if you bet incorrectly, you lose more or like don't gain as much, and that's and that's a punishment. Uh, another thing is that uh, we we have this concept of finality, right? Where um, if a sufficient if a threshold of validators bet with extremely high probability on the same block, say like 99.99% on, on, that, that, on the same block, then uh, that block will be it's like finalized. And if any of those validators bet for another block at that height or bet with a non-negligible probability after that, uh, for any block at that height, or even if they propose another block at that height, then they'll like lose their entire security deposit. Okay. Uh, so first of all, it, it kind of makes sense to me why uh, miners would converge, uh, but do they have to? Could it happen also that they don't converge? Yeah, I mean they don't. They don't like have to converge. They're just incentivized to, and if they don't, then they are going to be operating at very likely a loss. Um, it always depends on kind of how many transaction fees they're losing. Sorry, they're making. But they're, if they if they're, if this is like their security deposit, and because they don't converge, they only get like this much back, then they're then the transaction fees need to add up to like a very large amount, and the transaction fees really pay the play the role of paying interest on the security deposits, and so very likely if you lose like you know a very large percentage of your security deposit due to non-convergence, you won't be able to make up the rest of it in transaction fees. Um, that said, an adversary could potentially bribe validators uh, in order to incentivize them not to converge, uh, in which case it might be rational for them not to converge. But kind of the goal of the protocol is to make it expensive for an adversary to uh, undermine the properties of the consensus. So the, the other thing I read you wrote somewhere was that, you know, with proof of work that the level of security sort of increases linearly. So let's say a, a transaction has been, you know, two blocks deep, two confirmations is roughly half as secure as one for four confirmations in. Is that roughly correct? So um, it's important when talking about security to discuss whether you mean economic security or Byzantine fault tolerance security. So in uh, the security of, of confirmations increases exponentially if you're talking about fault tolerance, i.e. if you assume that like more than 50% of the nodes are correct and that uh, every and then then like, you know, the probability of the of the Byzantine nodes creating a longer fork declines exponentially as you get more confirmations. But the economic security is only to do with the cost that it took to create those blocks. And so the cost of any block is like the same, right? I mean, at most 25 Bitcoins. Um, that, and then like, you know, you get 25 Bitcoins for the first block, 50 once you have two, 75 once you have three, you know, 100 once you have four. Uh, so it's in the economic sense of security that uh, that it increases linearly. Now, in kind of this kind of betting approach, validators have the ability to kind of slowly put, place only a little bit of little, only suffer a little bit of loss if they're incorrect at first by by not betting with very high probabilities. But then once they see that everyone is betting on the same block, quickly going to uh, bet on all of their deposit. 
so you can have, for, for a good amount of time, super linear growth in the amount of economic clout behind a block being finalized. Okay, and, and that would also be the incentive, for example, for a validator to bet in the first place, because if they don't, then they lose some, or they don't make back as much of their security deposit. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and, and uh, I suppose that will sort of depend on maybe the risk tolerance or how much knowledge a validator has, whether they say, we're gonna do uh, a high probability bet on on you know on this one block, or we're gonna have sort of a wide distribution of bets across a, a big range of block because we're not as sure. Or how does the how would the strategies vary there? Yeah, so that's 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 a, that's a great question. I mean, surely risk preference is one thing that might vary between them. Um, another one is that like you know Byzantine validators might behave in a way where they're just trying to mislead other people's bets. Um, but generally, um, you have an incentive to go earlier, but you're taking more risk if you go earlier. And so basically, yeah, based on their risk preferences, they'll kind of have more or less aggressive strategies. But in any case, their incentive is to converge. At least their in-protocol incentive is to converge. So, so what's that actually going to look like? I mean, let's say now I'm going to be a validator on Casper. Uh, where do I get this software from that actually makes these bets? I mean, you know, just like a miner has like software that kind of chooses where to mine the next block, uh, namely on like the head of the fork, uh, your like validator software, wherever you get it from, is going to have a betting strategy. But this is going to be way more complicated. Yeah, sure. Because one of the things when I was when I was reading about that and thinking about it, that sort of came up with me was that, well, how is that gonna actually turn out, right? So presumably you're gonna be able to do a lot of analysis if you've sophisticated, you know, and you basically sort of like a hedge fund today tries to understand the stock market and, and does gets physicists and uh, data analysts uh, that do, you know, models and high frequency trading and stuff. And, you know, that way often they can reliably do better and it seems here you could end up with something similar, right? So I would hire 10 people, uh, put, you know, become a big validator uh, and really try to understand, you know, when can I place the optimal bets? Uh, and presumably I'd be able to do, you know, way better than someone who just does a little open source GitHub repo to have some sort of primitive betting strategy. Yeah. I don't think that that's at all clear at this point. Um, so firstly, like this kind of betting game is relatively simple, right? Um, as a function of what bets you've seen, uh, it's pretty easy to see what what block has the highest probability bets from the most validators. And you can just kind of, so there's not, there's not that much that you can really learn about the state of the consensus by having more sophisticated algorithms. What may help is having a more reliable, faster internet connection to the rest of the validators. But uh, what we're hoping to do is to show both that if people pursue more profitable strategies, then we don't lose any of the consensus properties. In fact, the consensus properties just get stronger, uh, i.e., you know, finality will happen faster in that case. But you also have a centralization probably, right? Not, not necessarily. So. So let's get onto the centralization issue, actually. So I've mentioned earlier that um, validators don't have an incentive to exclude blocks from other validators. Now, what that means is that um, even if some validator is kind of slow and lagging, everyone still has an incentive to include all of their bets and include all of their blocks and have their blocks win uh, because everyone is 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 uh, is punished if they aren't included and or if their blocks don't win and so actually even if some nodes have performance advantages everyone has to respect every other node if they want to increase their profitability and so you know centralization is about power dynamics much more than it is about uh, relative like you know whether some node has lower costs or higher returns than another node and the important thing is that uh, 
the people who have an advantage can't use it at the expense of everyone else and that they have to get along with everyone else even if those people don't have an advantage. Uh, but, you know, I actually think that this, this betting strategy is relatively simple and that improvements will not be that dramatic. Uh, and if they, if they are, then everyone will be able to see how these people have bet and they'll be able to notice that, hey, there's a way we can change our, pro our programs to bet more efficiently. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as concerned about this. Uh, but, I mean, I definitely hear you, and it is something that could potentially lead to some validators having higher returns than others. But in terms of like that, the impact of that on the consensus properties and on the decentralization of the thing, I think uh, that you know it, it'll actually only improve consensus and that the decentralization won't be affected. Today's magic word is ghost, G-H-O-S-T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. There was an interesting post by uh, Daniel Larimer, uh, who's the, the BitShares guy, about, uh, about Casper. And, and one of the criticisms he made of Casper there, I thought was very interesting as well, was basically uh, the point that, because you mentioned essentially transaction fees work a little bit like an interest rate. So let's say I put up uh, $500,000 uh, in bond and I run a node now and that node costs me $50,000 a year. You know, that $50,000 is independent of the amount of my bond. So if somebody else tries to run a node and, you know, it also costs $50,000, but they only have a 70,000 security deposit, you know, our profitability will be hugely different. And there's a strong incentive to have, uh, you know, basically centralization, right? To have a, as much of a security deposit as possible relative to the number of nodes validated as you run. Do you see that as a problem that you have sort of economic incentive for centralization there? Yeah. So I, I, it's, it's, it's again, not centralization in the sense that like the majority gets to have special rights that they get to like disrespect minorities over. Uh, but, uh, certainly, uh, one of the things that needs to be the case in the, for this consensus protocol to be like kind of fair between people with, who have different bonds is that the cost of operating a node should be should be should be much less than fifty thousand dollars or really like you know, very small. I mean, um, you know, like even to get like an AML, like a like a web server for a year costs much less than fifty thousand dollars. Depends obviously on the web server, but. Um, I think that we'll be looking at much, much lower cost of operation than that. Uh, so, I mean, like today, you can run an Ethereum node on your laptop, and if we're running on the same transactions per second, uh, as, I mean, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi, and if we're running at the same rate as we are now with Casper, I mean, you'll still be able to do it on your laptop. And then we're talking about like a much more negligible kind of cost. The thing is, though, that you would want to monitor it and be kind of diligent about the f whether or not you're compromised. That's one of the diff main differences between proof of work and proof of stake is that if your node is compromised, you could potentially suffer losses in a proof of stake type protocol. Right, because you have to have uh, basically the private keys that secure your bond, they have to be online, right? So you have to also invest in security there. Yeah, although um, much more than not being compromised, you need to be sure that your machine cannot publish Byzantine uh, behavior. So. Um, you know, if, if an adversary gets at your private key, well, that's pretty bad. They can try to unbond you, but do you have to use, as long as you still have access to that private key, you could potentially, um, revoke and change that decision. But, um, what you really don't want is for an adversary to get into your machine and cause you to double sign or right to try to unfinalize the finalized block in order to have you lose your security deposit. Right. So, so, so would that be your optimal? Let's say I'm as an adversary, I take over your machine and then if I double spend on the other chain and then, and then use that transaction immediately to prove that, well, you double spend or double signed, uh, then I can steal basically your, your bond. I mean, no, you don't steal it. I mean, the bond gets like destroyed and you make like a small royalty for discovering the malfeasance. Okay. But then couldn't I just transfer the, your bond to my account? Um, not exactly. I mean, it's not necessarily that simple. Um, so the un there's a large unbonding time where uh, basically because you can't just withdraw your bond at any time. 
you need to kind of retire from validating and keep your bond there for a time, just in case you're malicious. You were you were you were you were, you double signed right before you withdrew it, and the evidence just hasn't come to bear yet. So there's an unbonding time, and during that unbonding time, if you still have control of your private key, you can revise and say, no, you know, it's not going to go to that attacker, or no, and or 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 maybe you could just like burn it. There's lots of things you could do to prevent the attacker to actually get that uh, that money. Okay, interesting. And and what about because you you mentioned you know it would be cheap to run a node, and, and I guess that's that's sort of where the question turns, right? Is is you know how much security you need, extra infrastructure, how important is it to get? Uh, you know, a super low latency thing. Uh, do you need DDoS protection? Because, uh, you know, potentially then there's a lot of additional infrastructure maybe you need to put in in order to run at least a validator well and securely. Uh, so I, I guess we, we don't know yet where that's going to go. Yeah, we certainly we don't know all the details. Uh, but one thing to note while you bring up the DDoS is that uh, one, the other validators don't have any incentive at all to DDoS you. This is kind of very much unlike proof of work where miners kind of DOS each other on a regular basis. This is something that like, is known to happen uh, because it's like in their immediate incentive if some other mining pool has their block orphaned. Um, whereas with, with in he, here, the, the people who would be DOSing you would presumably be outside adversaries or maybe people who are being bribed by outside, outside adversaries. So it's the kind of environment you see when you, when you think ahead, you know, now Casper is implemented, Ethereum is running on Casper. Do you see a, a thousand Casper validator or, or a hundred or I presume it's not 10 that you'd like to see or, or, or 50,000? And do you think those will be run by hobbyists at home or will those be organizations running them? Uh, I guess like in Bitcoin mining, right? You have professional companies who invest a lot of money in research, where do you think that's going to go? So that's a good question. I mean, to give you an exact number, uh, we're going to need to see per the precise overhead numbers. We need to know exactly how much overhead it would cost uh, you know, for a given number of nodes at a given level of latency. So if we knew what latency we wanted and how much overhead it would be for a given number of nodes, then we could say kind of, OK, We'd, you know, we can have like 500 nodes, or we can have 1,000 nodes, we can have 10,000 nodes, depending. So basically, the, 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 because all the validators are engaged in betting on all the blocks, the, o the overhead, uh, network overhead increases with the number of validators. And so certainly it won't be 50,000, probably won't be 1,000, but I'm sure we could do at least 100. So I'd say, you know, somewhere between 100 and 1,000. And as to the level of sophistication of the validators, um, that's also an interesting question. Um, I think that you will certainly need to be more sophisticated than a hobbyist Bitcoin miner, which basically just requires you to get a box, plug it in the wall, and connect to the internet. Um, and so I don't think it'll be like, you know, if you want to support the Ethereum network, you might you should probably like build a dApp or serve files on Swarm or uh, just like sync up and audit and make sure the validators aren't producing invalid blocks or betting, ro betting in maliciously. Um, so I think it'll be, you know, some, it certainly requires a little bit more, a little bit more skill than it requires to mine Bitcoins. But we have to always remember that mining or validation is a, is a service that you're providing to clients. It's not meant to be, uh, that we're, that we're like advertising mining or validating to people as like something that they should do as clients or as users. This is something like the sort. The validators are actually like the largest source of risk to the protocol, and the protocol kind of treats them as such. Um, it won't necessarily be uh, a walk in the park for the validators all the time, um, but that's kind of the nature of the thing. If we want economic security, uh, then then these validators are really need to be exposed to loss. And it'll probably come. There'll probably be a time when they experience loss. Um, you know, not that miners haven't experienced loss before. Yeah, yeah. And what what percentage of miners have to be honest for Casper to work? And and are there different thresholds where it's, you know, I don't know. It's like thirty percent dishonest miners. This can happen. Fifty percent that can happen. Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. Uh, basically, we kind of need to 
talk about it on a kind of case-by-case -case basis for different types of protocol guarantees. So first one that we classically talk about in these contexts is the reverting history. So you can never revert a finalized block no matter how many validators you have um, because clients will just not choose a fork that doesn't include that finalized block. But you can revert non-finalized blocks if you just have more validators than we're used to, not to create those non-finalized blocks. So for example, if there are you know, 48% of the validators creating unfinalized blocks, then you know, 49, 50, 51% of the validators could revert those blocks. And it's worth noting that um, clients will be made aware of whether or not the blocks that they're receiving co as confirmations are fi being finalized or not. And so people won't actually be like caught off guard uh, with respect to their transaction being reverted because th you know it'll be very clear that their block isn't finalized. So you know in Bitcoin we have this rule: okay, don't ship your goods until you get six confirmations. In Casper it'll be you know don't ship until the block is finalized. And so if you're worried about like double spends, then you need to be careful that the blocks are finalized before you consider yourself safe. And once it's finalized, there's no amount of no amount of val va Byzantine validators that can revert that. Uh, and then another important protocol guarantee is censorship resistance. And as I mentioned a couple of times, the protocol punishes any indication of censorship um, by, you know, through directly disincentivizing the validators who are participating. So if like 20% of the validators are being censored, then the 80% will uh, lose, will, will be like losing money very likely, although it always depends on the volume of transaction fees. Um, and then, you know, and also notably, uh, if those 20% just go offline, then they, the protocol will have to assume that they're being censored and those, those 80% will be losing money. So, so in that scenario, what about those 20%? Are they also losing money? Oh yeah, they're losing money too, of course. Uh, do they lose more money than the 80%? That's a great question. Um, it seems like the answer will be yes for a small number of nodes, but once a larger and larger number of nodes are offline or potentially censored, then they will lose uh, less than the majority will. Right, because otherwise that could be like, uh, if I'm, you know, have a majority, I might say like, okay, I'm, I'm censoring a minority. I mean, I'm, I'm giving up some money, but they're giving up even more money. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to get them to leave the network. Uh, and then I get a bigger share of the transaction fees and make more money later. Would something like that work? Or are there other ways that a majority can basically cut out a minority to sort of increase control and profitability of the network? So the only way they can do it is through censorship, and the amount of time that they need to wait before they will be pushed offline is something that the protocol defines. And basically the way that we'll, we'll define that is to make sure that the co current value of the cost of censorship is almost surely greater than the current value of the increased returns from censorship that you get once those nodes are taken offline. Um, so basically like you can look at the cost over time of censoring, and then you can look at the return over time from having those people left after you know they were dropped out and you can kind of do like this kind of present value calculation to make sure that this is greater than that um and so so like that's kind of so we we do like think about you know is it going to be worth it for them to do the censorship um but also very notably there is no other known public consensus protocol or public public consensus protocol uh that has this property that is unprofitable to censor for example like if 80 percent of the bitcoin miners decide to ignore 20 percent they get a 25% raise immediately in, in terms of transaction fees and in two weeks in terms of in increased block rewards. So, like, if you think about like two weeks of like you know maybe slightly slower block rewards, and that's kind of only if you choose not to lie about the timestamps. But, anyways, if 20, that's not very long, and it's like totally worth it. 25% raise for a miner is a very significant raise. Um, you know, the same thing is true of all known proof of stake systems. Um, and so Casper is really unique in the regard that, that it is costly at all for them to censor. Um, and, you know, censorship is like, censorship resistance is like one of the most important claim properties of blockchains. But so far, it's in any like majority coalition's validators' positions, uh, sorry, interest or miners' interest to censor in like every known public consensus protocol.
Okay, well, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, Tendermint because we're actually we're going to do an episode about Tendermint very soon, and then I, I've been thinking a little bit about Tendermint and learning a bit more about it also because at you know at Ares we work with Tendermint, and the Tendermint is basically you know a different proof of stake protocol, and and it's it's the, the way Tendermint works right is that a, a block is proposed and basically the validators sort of vote on it, and you know if a, if a majority of validators have approved it, you know that's that's the block. Um, which seems like a very sort of clean and simple mechanism. Why did you, why was it necessary here to have this betting thing instead of something like just one, you know, just people voting on blocks and, and then that being the result? Sure. So, I mean, the, the kind of intuitive, simple way to think about it is in Tendermint, uh, you, you kind of pass around votes before you create the block. In Casper, you create the block and then pass around votes. The reason we call them bets is because it's like literally putting like economic stake as to whether or not the one that you're proposing will become finalized really does. And the, basically the reason why we kind of do the betting after rather than before the block is created is because we favor availability instead of consistency in the event of network partitions, right? We don't want to require permission from the large set of validators in order to create a block. And the reason for that is that it um, well, there's, there's kind of two reasons, but the main reason for that is that uh, it, it affects the coalition economics, right? I, if you require a Byzantine quorum to create a block, then there is a minority coalition that can prevent a block from forming. And they could use that to, say, choose which blocks form. They can use that to extort the network. And kind of by, by defining the number of nodes required for a block to be created, um, you necessarily affect the economics of the protocol. And the other reason is that we can provide lower latency blocks because a validator doesn't need to have this back and forth with all the other validators before they provide a client a block. Right, but then you have a block that may not end up being the real block, right? Because it's not finalized and... Of course, yeah. But, but, but clients are made aware of the state of the finality of their blocks. But do you think, in terms of a sort of UX perspective, do you think that's a benefit? Because to me, it almost seems like it's actually a downside. Okay, so, I mean, firstly, um, the UX isn't really immediately the user's experience, right? It's the, it's the application developer who needs to deal with this logic and then, and then deal with how they show their user the corresponding, like, truth of the matter, right? Right. So... For certain types of transactions, um, there's not going to be any chance that another transaction comes in uh, and has priority over yours. So there, even, even if your block doesn't win at that height, your transaction will be included and everything will be okay. Um, so for some applications, it won't be a big deal at all. Or for other applications, uh, notably like economic applications where you really need to know that it'll never be reverted, um, your application has the responsibility of telling you you know, okay, you know, yes, we got the message and here's what we think will happen and then update that story if things end up changing. And now, but another another thing to note is that uh, because we incentivize the validators to produce blocks in a particular order, it will, if the validators are su successfully seeking profit in protocol, you'll, you'll have a very high probability of your block ending up being finalized even well before it's finalized. Um, now, if the, if the, but that, of course, depends on the validator's ability to actually game the incentives in the consensus protocol. Presumably, if, that, if they're primarily incentivized by that, they will. If, they, if people are also bribing them to affect maybe people's user experience in a negative way, then maybe they, maybe they won't. Um, but surely there are many kinds of transactions that, uh, where this won't be a problem. And for those, and for those transactions or those applications, uh, it'll be like a uniform positive. Um, now, the application developer might not appreciate having to deal with the question of whether uh, a transaction has been finalized, but um, I think that they would rather have that and low latency than sacrifice latency for uh, the simplicity of their environment. Okay, so, so you think that uh, with Casper, you're basically... You know, with Tendermint, maybe you would take in, in, in a sort of a larger network, like you hope to have here with 100 distributed nodes, maybe it would take a, I don't know how long it would take, a few seconds? 
or well, it depends. And maybe if there's some sort of conflict and stuff, maybe it would take longer. Let's say ten seconds or fifteen seconds. So you think it would be better to have uh, five seconds? Or how, how fast is actually Casper going to be? Well, um, so Vitalik's target is four seconds. Mine is like one or less. Um, I'm really hoping to go and like have the latency be as low as tolerable. Right. And the reason yeah. I say tolerable is because lower latency always increases overhead. Right, right, right. So, so you say, okay, it's, it's better to have like, you know, one second or, uh, where you have, you know, some probability of it being secure than let's say three seconds where you don't know anything. And then you have, you have a block that, that really is final and, you know, you can completely rely on that. Yeah. I mean, and remember that we will get finality eventually anyways. Um, the question of how fast finality will occur is still in the uh, kind of open because it depends on how aggressive validators are uh, feeling and how, how aggressive they're willing to be and able to be in finalizing blocks. Um, if the network is really predictable and they can all behave in a really orderly way all the time, you could conceivably, conceivably finalize blocks uh, as fast or almost as fast as Tenderman can and still have the low latency. Likely, it'll be that uh, Tenement finalizes blocks faster than Casper does because um, of the kind of gradual way that the validators expose their economic uh, kind of stake to the finality of that block. Um, but I, th you know, I think that kind of uh, the pure economic nature of the consensus protocol uh, kind of necessitates that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, the low latency thing is basically uh, a plus from the economic point of view. Although it may, might be the case that validators just get more transaction fees from providing lower latency blocks. And so we can maybe weasel it and call, call low latency an economic benefit too. Wait, can, can you say that again? I didn't totally understand that one. Um, so, I mean, presumably, and this is kind of like an indirect argument, of there will be more transaction fees if uh, blocks are low latency because the application experience will be better, and so people will be using more dApps. Um, and so in a way, low latency is an economic aim of the validators. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense, right? But then, of course, again, you go into the lower you go with latency, the bigger the advantage is to do, you know, run validators in high performance data center, etc. And, you know, you're the more pressure there you create to have, or, you know, the more increased overhead and the costs of running a validator. Yeah, that's right. And um, there is a, an extent to which that may cause validators to, uh, you know, who are, can't keep up with that to go offline. But in as far as there are validators who uh, say, you know, don't have great internet connections and super powerful web servers while everyone else does, their validator, they will still be included in the consensus because of the cooperative kind of economics involved. Um, so if this change happens, it'll have to happen gradually because it'll be costly for, um, for the validators to leave everyone behind. Okay, great. So let's talk about the last topic, which is uh, light clients. What's that going to look like with Casper? Sure. So Casper is super light client friendly uh, because, well, primarily because of the, something we mentioned at the start of the conversation, which is the fact that we use security deposits to authenticate the state of the consensus. So validators having the list of the currently bonded, uh, so clients having the list of the currently bonded validators will be able to kind of authenticate economic proofs very easily. They won't need to download header chains, compare work. They can just download like some logs from like the most recent state and you know, bounce them off other validators to make to get them signed, uh, or to make sure that they're not incorrect, and then they get the, quickly have very high economic assurance that um, their log is correct. Because if it wasn't, then all these validators would lose security deposits. So, um, be, security deposit-based proof of stake in general is much more like client-friendly than proof of work because. Uh, Economic proofs are much more concise than proof of work proofs because economic proofs are just like, hey, you know, if two plus two isn't four, then I lose a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Proof of work proofs are like, hey, two plus two plus two plus two is four. I've got, you know, six blocks on top of it. Um, and then another thing that's notable on this on this on this topic is that. Um, 
I found a way to do uh, sub network latency block times uh, in a light client friendly way. So one problem with sub network latency stuff or light clients is that they have to do the fork choice rule on a very frequent basis, which is not very uh, not very light client friendly. But uh, actually, what we can do is we can calculate the re these reorganizations inside the state transition function of a block itself, which means that a, a validator, when they publish a block, will include okay all the new bets that they learned, and then and then which which meant that they need to re-execute some transactions, which led to this state, which means that your new transaction receipt is that, and so the validator so so client doesn't have to actually do all of that work of reorganizing and doing this kind of crazy fork slash tree choice rule stuff. Uh, and they can still, you know, have this low latency experience. So, um, you know, light client friendliness is like a, one of the top priorities in Casper's design. Uh, in, incidentally, I guess I should me measure the, uh, so I should just mention the other design design principles. So, so light client friendliness is one, low latency is one, uh, and economic efficiency is the main other one. And that means that as close as possible, we want to create a blockchain that is cheap for everyone except for attackers during an attack. We want to have like full coverage of Byzantine faults with disincentives, but to not have expenses for for people where possible uh, outside of Byzantine faults. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's one of the, the big uh, attractive things about proof of stake, whereas with, with something like Bitcoin and proof of work, uh, and that that's going to be a big problem in the future, right? With the block reward dropping, you know, it's going to be less and less investment in the hardware, and, and that means less security, right? Whereas here, you can sort of decouple it. I mean, okay, you still have the security dependent on uh, the the amount that's bonded, but you know, it's it's sort of not money wasted. It's just money locked up, right? So you you essentially the real cost of it in a way is only the 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 cost of capital there, plus, of course, the cost of operating the validators and stuff. But That's right. But there's also the cost to the attacker, right? Right, and the cost to the attacker is much higher, yeah. So where are we right now, Casper? When is it going to be live? So that's a good question. I mean, uh, I'd say that all the like fundamental research problems have been solved, uh, that we are arguing about specification details. Uh, but we're also working on implementation, verification, and simulation. Um, so basically, I, I'd say that um, optimistically, and it'll be done in a year. Uh, in a worse outlook, it could take two years. I don't think it'll take more than two years. It really depends on um, how much work I and others can do on this. Yeah, so I guess in that vein, what does that look like in terms of funding? Because, you know, if the foundation running out of money, uh, are you, is it going to be, continue to be possible for you to work on this? And uh, I know also you work with uh, a, a guy named Greg, who's working on actually implementing it. Um, what's that look like? How is um, the, the work on this going to be funded? Sure. So, I mean, um, well, there's kind of like, a broader question, which is how Ethereum broadly will continue to fund and govern core development, even as the foundation kind of becomes a smaller part of the community, which is an interesting question, one that I spend a lot of time thinking about, especially kind of more recently. Uh, and or and I'm hoping that we can have a situation where we govern and fund Ethereum using the Ethereum platform and smart contracts. Uh, as far as myself and Greg and hopefully others who will getting on, will be getting on board to work on Casper, um, I'm you know applying for grants. Uh, Augur was generous enough to give me a grant even though I hadn't applied for it just a few weeks ago. So thanks a lot to them. Um, and basically, yeah, I've hired Greg. So we you know we it's not it's, this kind of research and development isn't free. Uh, we are looking and exploring all all options for funding. Um, but you know, I'm not going to give up. I'll live with my parents if I have to. <laughs> Great. Well, that's that's a dedication that's necessary. Cool. And and so maybe maybe last question. So you um, you mentioned that to me that you meant developing this in Scala. Now at the moment, I don't think there's a Ethereum Scala client. So is is it would it be possible to just take Casper that consensus part and integrate it into other clients, or would would it have to be implemented? 
in each client, you know, a new, or, or do you think everybody's going to switch to Scala, or, or how is that going to work? So certainly everyone wants to implement it themselves, and so I think they will. Um, and but Scala, uh, Scala is compatible with like JavaScript, um, so certainly at least we can use the JavaScript implementation uh, in with the Scala code. As far as the other ones, I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't have much experience as a developer. Greg does though, and he could he could tell you. Uh, and yeah, the reason we're using Scala is because it's compatible with all um, with all the JavaScript. Java stuff, and also it um, it is strongly typed functional, uh, and so we can verify it, and simulate it in a much more formal formal manner. Excellent. Well, uh, Vlad, thanks so much for coming on. That was was really interesting diving into this. I think it's a topic a lot of people are interested in, and especially if you think it's sort of the future of cryptocurrencies, I'm sure proof of stake is going to be very, very important. So I'm, I'm glad we could dive into this. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, you know, I need to do education in any way I can uh, so that people are ready for this kind of thing and so that hopefully we can inspire more people to work on these problems. Um, and so, you know, thank you for your part. No, thanks. Thanks for coming on for that. Cheers. And yeah, Thanks so much for listening, for joining us. So we put out episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can get them, of course, in every podcast player. You get them also on YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenterbtc. And um, if you're a loyal listener, then you know you know what's coming now. Basically, we're still doing this uh, sort of bribery competition where if you leave us an iTunes review and you send us an email, uh, show at epicenterbitcoin.com, then we send you a t-shirt. Uh, and yeah, you can say bad things or negative things or great things. Anything is possible. Uh, and yeah, so just just do that, and we do appreciate that. Lots of people have done that so far. Um, and yeah, of course, you can always tip the show if you want to. So thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.